Recently, I was looking at our wedding album. It's one of the happiest days of our lives. It's flipping through the pages, glancing at the photos, looking at the faces of all of our family members and friends gathered with us on that day to celebrate that occasion. Brought back great memories. As I continued to flip through our album, that feeling of happiness gave way to a feeling of sadness. So as I looked more closely at the photos, I realized that for so many of the individuals in the photos, how much their lives have changed in the 16 years since we were married. Changes that were brought on by diseases, cancers, heart conditions, kidney disease, lung disease, neurological disorders. Often, when relatively speaking, we're still quite young. Now, there's nothing unusual about our family. And I'm sure that if you took a moment to reflect on your own families and what's happened over the last 16 years to your parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, siblings, you should probably recognize the same. More than 100 million Americans today suffer from a disease for which we have no cure or even meaningful therapeutic option. We declared a war on cancer over 40 years ago. It's been nearly 20 years since we doubled the spending of NIH, all in the hopes that science, coupled with new technologies, would bring forward new medicines. But the disappointing reality is that in spite of that intensified effort, in spite of the doubling of research spending, in that same period, the number of new medicines being approved each year has been cut in half. Think about that. Billions upon billions of dollars of research being spent each year, generating thousands upon thousands of scientific papers. And every day, hundreds of media stories with signs of hope. Yet the reality is we have few new medicines to speak of. This is due to what we in the healthcare sector call the valley of death. The chasm that lies between science and new medicines. It's illustrated in this cartoon from Nature. We're on the left here. You have science represented by a researcher who's spent 20, 30, 40 years of his or her life understanding a disease, coming up with that critical insight that might lead to a promising new medicine. And on this side, you have patients, families, and physicians waiting, hoping for a new treatment, a new cure, often with only years to live. Now, to understand the existence of this chasm between science and medicine, you need to understand how new medicines come to be. And it starts with that researcher who has that insight that may of a new medicine. In medicine, we call that a discovery. It's important to understand that that researcher has a discovery, but it's not yet a product. A product is a highly specialized therapeutic agent that may neutralize that disease, perhaps even cure the patient. But that product is not a medicine either. That product undergoes rigorous testing first in preclinical or animal studies, followed by controlled human clinical studies. And only after that rigorous testing has occurred to demonstrate that that product is both safe and effective will the FDA consider that product to be a new medicine available for patients and their physicians. Now, this system, which has worked historically to produce new medicines, today is fundamentally broken. And it's broken because the traditional players that have linked together to translate science into medicines are growing increasingly apart from one another. See, on this side, we still have researchers that are funded primarily by the government, 
researchers that exist in the institutions that surround us here in Cleveland and throughout the country that do a wonderful job of generating understanding, generating insights, coming up with new potential treatments for diseases that all of us suffer from. But those insights are still discoveries. And in spite of the talent that exists among those researchers, you do not have the experience, the resources, or the funding required to create a product, let alone a medicine. When you hear product, you think of companies. And historically, pharmaceutical companies and biotechnology companies have filled the gap. They've taken the baton at that point to continue the race forward towards new medicine. But unfortunately, over the last decade, due to pressures on their own businesses and financial models, they have drifted a further away from those discoveries, looking to focus their attention and resources on products that are closer to becoming medicines, closer to generating revenue, and closer to generating profit. That's what's created what confounds our sector and what we call that valley of death. Now this is on the tops of minds of everyone that's in the medical field and should be on top of the mind for citizens that are concerned about the generation of new medicines. Dr. Francis Collins, the current director of the National Institute of Health, describes it well in this quote that's on the screen behind me. On the one hand, you have an abundance of discovery that's been driven by year after year of funding by government coming up with these wonderful insights that are there that could potentially represent new medicines for patients. Yet, on the other side, we have this paucity of new medicines. The chart that I showed you as I started my speech, where we've doubled the input and cut the output in half. And what Dr. Collins calls for in his quote is he issues the challenge for bold, audacious, and innovative solutions that address this problem. Here in Cleveland, we have offered our own innovative solution to bridge the valley of death that we call the Harrington Project. The Harrington Project is an initiative that was launched in 2012 through a partnership of university hospitals, one of the nation's leading health systems, and the Harrington family, the entrepreneurial force behind one of the nation's medical leading medical supply companies, who came together with a sense of mission to bridge Medicine's Valley of Death. The project is a $250 million national initiative focused on accelerating discoveries into medicines through a unique and novel model, a model that aligns nonprofit and for profit elements towards this common goal. The nonprofit identifies discoveries that are promising and translates them into products does that by providing both funding and resources and expertise from the pharmaceutical sector. And the for-profit employs a new business model, one that's designed to advance these products to the point where they've demonstrated patient benefit. The two work in a system of alignment not only with one another, but a system that complements the other actors that are involved in the translation of science into medicines. But the most novel feature of this model that's been launched is the platform on which it's been built. The mission of this project is to accelerate discoveries into medicines. And through a attention to that mission, the platform that it's been built on is an open system that seeks out the best discoveries from research institutions and disease foundations anywhere in the country to bring into the system for the benefit of patients. Now, it's only been two years since we've launched this project, and these are early days, and in many ways, we are still proving that the bridge that we have built will function for the purpose that it's been designed. But the interest in this project is high, as evidenced by the technology, the talent, and the partnerships that have assembled around it. Talent in the form of advisory boards, filled with luminaries from the industry, from around the country, former heads of global pharmaceutical development, as well as leaders in science and medicine. Technologies 
in the form of submissions that have come to us from over 100 institutions in this country, 900 separate discoveries that have been submitted for consideration to our effort here in Cleveland to support their development. Inventors that reside at institutions from the West Coast to the East Coast and everywhere in between. All judged based on the promise of those discoveries and the potential they have for becoming medicines. Out of those 900 opportunities that we've seen in the last two years, we've selected 30 promising opportunities for development from places that you would expect as well as the unexpected. Representing potential breakthrough cures for cancers, heart disease, Alzheimer's, blindness, lung disease, kidney disease, the conditions that affect our family and likely yours. So the project has attracted technologies, it's attracted talent, and it's attracted partnerships. Back to our open system. In these two years, we've been able to partner with disease foundations, institutions, governmental agencies, and even pharmaceutical companies who have banded together with the Harrington Project towards this common goal. And when we launched this initiative, we launched it as our innovative response to a national challenge. We realize that the scale of our initiative, which might seem large to you in the audience, is still relatively small compared to the needs of patients that are out there. So while we hope to bring forward a number of new medicines through our initiative, we hope even more that through this effort, through our model, we're able to demonstrate a design for a bridge that can be replicated by others. It's focused on our mission. We welcome collaborators to work with us. And we also welcome competitors to learn from us and compete against us. Because only by working together will we achieve our mission of accelerating breakthrough discoveries into medicines for the benefit of patients and our family and yours. Thank you.